Hey, this is Craig from the Paul Merriman Foundation. Paul and I recently got together to discuss We're Talking Millions. A couple hours later, we realized we had a wonderful deep dive on each of the 12 simple steps recommended in the book, and that it would be best for you if we split it into two parts. I hope you enjoy this first part where we discuss steps one through five of We're Talking Millions. Well, this is a, a very special presentation tonight. I am I am thrilled to have the opportunity to share uh, this information because it is something uh, not only near and dear to my heart uh, and near and dear to my brain, as it turns out, but we came out, as most of you know, with a new book about a year ago, and we made a pitch. We made a pitch for the idea that if you did the things that Rich Buck and I wanted you to do, if you chose the path that we wanted you to go, and there was never really more than one or maybe two other choices, and that we thought every one of those was a million-dollar decision. But it didn't quite get explained at that time the way I wanted it to be explained. So I'm here partly tonight to explain it my way, not Rich's way. By the way, Rich and I have been working together for 30 years, so uh, he's a great partner to have. But he doubted me. He doubted me when I made the point, Rich, each one of these decisions is not just about a million dollars. It is about a million dollars more than you would have gotten going the other direction, taking the other path. And then, as luck would have it, and by the way, luck, I, I think in everybody's life is a, is a major factor and when I look back at the luck that I've had, the people I've met along the way, like Rich, like my son. I mean, I had no idea what he was going to be in my life when he was born, but he ended up basically being my boss at one time, and a great boss he was too. And then Dennis Tilly, the, the, one of the finest market timers I've ever met. And then Tom Cock came along, and I met him, and he joined us, and he he, he introduced me on how to do radio and how to do a podcast. And all of these people. But then there was Chris Pedersen who came along and brought us two funds for life and the best in class ETF series. And Daryl Balls who came along. And by the way, I had known Daryl for probably 20 years before he came along and became part of the team. All luck that they became available at the time that I, I guess I needed them. And in fact, Asian Griffin, who has been with me since day number one of this foundation, I just happened to meet her at a book writers conference in San Miguel de Allende. She was a teacher and I was a willing student. And then we be. We worked together for, what, 10 plus years now. So then you always wonder when your luck's going to run out. Well, then this year came along, and along came the guy who's here with me tonight, and that's Craig Apple. Craig kind of walked, he didn't walk in the door. In the old days, he would have walked in the door. Maybe he would have sent me a snail letter or whatever, but no, he sent me an email, and he offered to bring a piece of software to this organization in the hopes that it would help the people who are following the work that all these other great people have helped put together, putting that money to work in a calculator that people could then do their own testing, do their own numbers crunching to find out what would have happened if and as you all know, we live purely in a what-if business because you can make your futures up. But what we tend to do is we look backwards and we say, what if we had put money into that strategy? And Craig has made it so dirt simple. 
for you to be able to test all of the academic research that we relied on to give you the numbers to build your decisions. So why we're here tonight is that Craig knows my desire to convince people that yes, each one of these is in fact a million dollar decision. And he said, why don't we just put it to the test? Why don't we kill two birds with one stone? And that would be that we would both teach people what the, the calculator, the lifetime investment calculator, which looks at you as an accumulator while you're growing your assets for retirement, or it looks at you and works with you and shows you what it's like to be in the distribution phase of your life. So what we're going to do, and I think this is a great idea, Greg, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each one of those 12 major decisions that come when you follow the book. We're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. We're going to put each one of them to the task to make the case that, yes, it is a million dollar additional decision. And so what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to introduce Craig, and I think most of you know Craig, if you've been following the calculator, certainly you do. Uh, and, and he's going to get us started in the right direction. And then he's going to let me introduce each of the 12 decision points. And then he's going to take it back and he's going to show us the evidence. Now, I want you to notice we never call it the proof because the proof would suggest guarantee. This is only evidence. And so we're going to watch the evidence and then I'm going to weigh back in with some additional comments. If I feel like there's something more uh, that, that I saw or wanted to, to address, and then we move on to number two. So Craig, thank you for coming up with this great idea. And, and thank you for bringing the calculator to our organization and to the tens of thousands of people who are following our work. It's a, it, it is a blessing. Thank you. And why don't you get us started? And uh, it, inter in fact, there may even be a few people that don't know about your calculator. So start wherever you, wherever you wish, but help prove, oh, I'm sorry, help convince us that those million dollar decisions are good. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And I have to say this, um, this book, and I, I do have a hard copy, is, uh, is uh, incredible. Um, I can't, you know, I, I, I got it uh, a few months ago, actually, because I was working through all the, the PowerPoint, I mean, the, the podcast content. Uh, and when I read it, I really realized, hey, you know, we can actually use this tool to, uh, to prove each of these 12 um, steps. So that's, uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, and we actually use the Lifetime Investment Calculator, calculator and we're going to use um, some other tools uh, to, to prove some of them as well, where the calculator isn't fully uh, functional. So uh, what I'll do first is I'll go ahead and share my screen. So I'll be sharing screen and going back to video a bit in this presentation. Uh, I'll share my screen and give you just a, a brief overview of the calculator and the layout so that I can orient everyone. We'll talk about, uh, well, I'll show you the 12 steps as they are presented in the book. Of course, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the book is freely available as a PDF right now. Um, so if you sign up, at paulmerriman.com for the newsletter, you get automatic free access to We're Talking Billions. And you can both read the book and follow along uh, as we go through this uh, presentation. Feel free at any moment to pause, rewind. Um, there's a whole lot of content that we're gonna go through uh, in this one. So I'll start sharing my screen. Right, I wonder if that went up. No, it didn't go, one second. Okay, and 
Um, Paul, can you confirm that you're able to see my screen now? I can. Perfect. So this is our Lifetime Investment Calculator homepage. It provides a, an overview of the calculator. It provides a, des a description of each of the entries or parameters that you can add. Uh, we have some frequently asked questions, uh, links to other videos. So if you want more information, you feel free to um, add or go and click on those videos in the YouTube channel. So I'll scroll up and this is the primary calculator. Uh, I always like to, to make this calculator full screen and you do that by clicking the button in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, we use Tableau, uh, which is the, the technical software that, that, uh, that the calculator is built on. And just to provide a, a brief layout, I wanted to share that on the right hand side, these are all of the parameters, okay? So you're able to, to choose between the foundation strategies. You can identify different um, equity or fixed income allocations. Uh, you can show nominal or real, uh, real returns. Uh, identify any starting year, which is the first sequence year. You can choose a duration up to 200 years. Enter any starting value. Um, you can change the historical returns. Uh, and then uh, enter information about contributions and uh, distributions. If you're uh, looking for a detailed explanation of each of these parameters and how they affect the calculation, uh, you can find that on our website just below the calculator. On the left-hand side is, uh, is the, the data and where the calculations are. Uh, we have in the far left columns, the years, uh, the sequence of returns, any contribution that you may be putting. And then uh, we have the equity and fixed income allocations. And so during this presentation, you'll see me uh, toggle the parameters on the right-hand side, and the views will change in the middle um, uh, and, and on the left. So for example, if I choose 100% stocks and 0% bonds over in the equity and fixed income allocation, you'll see that it quickly uh, toggles just to one column. And this will actually be our primary view uh, for, for most of the presentation. All right. So... Uh, you will also see me frequently refresh. Uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, exercise. If you ever want to start over, um, you're able to just hit the refresh button on your browser and it'll go right back to those default settings uh, every time. So we're talking millions. I have the 12 steps here. I'm gonna put up on a slide. And so these are the 12 steps that are presented in the book. And we're going to go through each of them. Uh, and we're going to one by one present the case of uh, how each step can add an additional million dollars uh, over a long investment period. You know, actually, why don't you go down and go and download the PDF right now? Feel free to pause the video uh, because then you'll have it in front of you, right? You'll have everything that I'm talking about right in front of you in the same in the same screen. Um, so that actually, okay, yeah, sign up for the newsletter and, uh, <laughs> and go get the uh, go get the free PDF. Uh, if you're so inclined, you like the hard copy, that's available on Amazon, of course. Each of these stages. Um, we have a kind of a common scenario that we're, going to, that we're going to present. So when we're talking millions, we're looking over a 40 year accumulation period. So someone who uh, starts at age 20 or 25 and then they save uh, from that period until they turn 65. Uh, the common scenario that we're gonna show is saving $5,000 per year for that, for that accumulation period and then once they hit 65, we're gonna show an additional 30 years of living off of what they've accumulated, right? Uh, another kind of tidbit is that all of the growth is in nominal terms. So that means it does include inflation. And um, as, as you know, that has a, a significant impact. Um, but you know, in many cases, we have multiple millions of dollars uh, of returns and results. So that's the setup. Um, the starting year for simplicity, again, we've got a great deal of content uh, in this presentation. Uh, so we'll mo most often start with the first year of 1970, but you can start any, uh, any year that you choose when you're going through and working with the, the lifetime investment calculator. 
So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over, hand it back to you, Paul, to talk about our first, um, yes. our first thank, step. Thank you, Chris. And I just want to, I just want to make a comment. Uh, there are uh, this nominal versus real return. And the fact that the returns that we are going to be looking at in this presentation uh, are what you, what the way you state it is include inflation. Now, Chris does that as well. Maybe all engineers do that. But, but I always think of it, what we call nominal, as not deducting the impact of inflation versus real rates of return are what is that, do what is that dollar really buy after you take inflation into consideration? And so we are, are talking nominal tonight, but but when we're talking millions, it's a good idea to check the real rate of return. And the good thing is with, 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 with Craig's uh, calculator here, it will do that with a, uh, just a flick of the wrist. And the first one we're going to talk about here, it is so obvious, this difference between uh, adding another million or not. We're talking about making the decision whether to save or to spend. And so, Craig, how are you going to quantify that and make it worth a million dollars? All right. So <clears throat> you have to save. You have to save so that you have something to work with, right? Um, so the recommendation in the book is that you save a little bit every month over a 40 year period and at an 8% return rate uh, after 40 years, uh, you will try to reach $300,000. And so you'll see how important this $300,000 is uh, in a moment. But once you reach that $300,000 over the subsequent 30 years of your distribution phase, um, that $300,000 will grow into at least another million dollars. So I'll uh, jump into the calculator and show you for this first step how saving a little bit each month um, can get you to that $300,000. And then I'll, show, then I'll show you how <coughs> the subsequent 30 years it, uh, it plays out for large distributions. That's great. Okay, so I've uh, gone back and shared my screen. And I'm going to reset the, uh, refresh the, the browser window, which resets the calculator and we'll make it full screen. I listen to all the podcasts. I don't necessarily watch the videos. So I'm trying to, <laughs> to make it uh, entertaining for listeners as well. So our, we're gonna start with our baseline scenario. Most of them are going to be in the S&P 500. So the strategy I've chosen is S&P 500. And I'm going to start and display the 100% stocks uh, uh, allocation. So 0% bonds. Our first sequence year is 1970. We're going to show a 45-year duration with a $0 starting value. Okay. And 40 years of $5,000 contributions that are not scaled with inflation. Okay. So I just got to toggle this last one. And so, oh, forgive me, not $5,000. I'm not there yet. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, uh, with zero, actually. Okay. So the idea here is that someone who's 20 years old can save for 45 years. Okay. And if they save $300 a year, so the contribution amount is $300 for 40 years, um, over a 45 year period from, oh, that's 40 years, 45 year period. So they turn 65, uh, over a 45 year period from 1970 to 2014, they reach $328,000. So in total, um, they've saved, you know, just over, I guess, $13,500 over those 45 years. That's all that they've outlaid. And they've reached three hundred and twenty-eight thousand um, dollars in this one hundred percent stock portfolio for the S and P five hundred. So that you know we we found our 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 three hundred thousand dollars. And by the way, three hundred dollars per month um, per year is only twenty-five dollars a month, right? 
So in this case, if you're in for such a long time, uh, $25 a month socked away into a S&P 500 uh, uh, kind of index fund would, would allow us to reach that million dollar goal over the full 70 year period. So at age 65, they have 328,000. Now I'm gonna simulate the distribution. So I have to add another 30 years, okay? So I'm going to go a 75-year duration instead of a 45-year duration. Uh, they're still only contributing up to year 45. And we're going to pull out. Uh, we're going to start distributing in year 46. And we're going to distribute for 30 years at a 4% distribution rate. And we're going to use the, the flexible uh, distribution uh, which is effectively um, pulling 4% of the portfolio's value out at that time, okay? So over the subsequent 30 years, our ending balance at, uh, after 75 years of investment is $2.6 million. And we've pulled out of that just over a million dollars uh, to live off of. So... Uh, that this shows that reaching that $300,000, in this case, $328,000 threshold, uh, in the subsequent 30 years, you can pull money out and, and have multiple millions of dollars uh, if you stop investing at that time. Uh, Paul, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, it sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? So here's a, a question I have, Craig. I mean, people are looking at these numbers and thinking, if I get to 300,000, that is going to turn into a million in either distributions or money that I leave to my heirs. And it looks like it's a lot, a lot more than just a million here uh, as we look at this. But there is one thing we have to remember we are talking about this relatively small amount of money that's been invested, all going into equities over a 45-year period, is it we're talking about here? That's right. Well, the entire thing is 100% stocks in the S&P 500. Yes. Uh, yep. Now, people may think, oh, well, it must have been a special period of time. That there, that's that, that's where the books are being cooked in, in that this was a period that the returns were abnormally high. In fact, they were almost one percent lower than the average forty-year return of the S and P five hundred. So, in a way, what you see here is, is normal. Now, you might say, "Well, I, I'm not going to have all my money in equities." Well, maybe you won't have. I'm 78 and I only have half. We only have half of our money in equities, but the equities are still the equities and they're still doing their thing up or down. But if you look at this early money, it would not be abnormal for somebody to put this money away and say, this is going to be an equity position until I retire. That, that is not an abnormal thing. Doesn't mean they have something else going on that's more conservative elsewhere. But our, our question here is this save versus spend. And boy, it looks, it, it looks like it is an easy, if we want to call another million dollars a home run, and all it takes is that $300,000 at retirement. Right, and so I'll make it even better. Um, I jumped straight into distributions, but mm. what if you didn't distribute and you just let it ride for the subsequent uh, 30 years? So 75 years of, of growth in 100% stocks in the S&P 500, right? That bottom, that bottom number, um, of course, we've looped back from, once we hit 2020, we looped back to 1970, yeah. but uh, we're kind of showing you could reach $8 million just by investing at 13,500 uh, over that 45 year period. It is the magic of compounding. It is still hard to believe, but it works. All right, do we need to go on to number two? Absolutely. Or we'll never get to bed here. <laughs> <laughs> number two is to save and invest early rather than later. So 
Uh, show us how that can be worth another million. Great. So we're going to stay with the same screen. Uh, I haven't changed anything here. And what we showed was a 20-year-old a investing uh, $300 for 45 years, right? Uh, what would happen if a 30-year-old saved $300 per year for 35 years, mm. right? And so what I'll do is I'll adjust here. Um, I, the contribution duration is actually going to be 35 because uh, that's how, how long they're contributing. And the first year is going to be year 10, right? So we missed, somebody didn't start saving at age 20. They started saving at age 30, right? So, uh, and I'm going to actually go back to a 45 year um, so that I can get rid of the, the extra uh, tail at the bottom. So if you only save $300 and you start at age 30, um, you have, sorry, I want to, I want to start at year 11, right? Um, okay. So the bottom, uh, you would only have $109,000, uh, instead of, uh, $328,000, like we showed for a 25 year old. So if you want to hit that $300,000, you need to save more every year. And I did the math in the background, and you need to save about $900 per month to reach $328,000 if you start at age 31. Now, now say that again. It, it, you, you have to save how much a month? I'm sorry, not per month, $900 per year. Forgive me. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, I need to note that the book, so the book talks about months and the calculator yes. does it annually. So I sometimes get confused. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Right. So, but it's, it's $900 a year or about $75 per month. It would be what you have to save yeah. to reach that same dollar value. So, so then when you look at that 10 years of, uh, that you start out behind, uh, it also, there's some other forces that start to come to impact the, the, the value. For example, you might be very aggressive in those very early years in terms of the equities. It might not just be the S&P 500. It might be small cap value. There are a lot of things that a 20-year-old uh, and a 30-year-old, might, might, they might do it differently, which would also slow the process down for that person who starts later. So uh, it is... Uh, and Now, Where's the million dollars? Where do I actually see the million dollars? What you're telling me is that there's going to be, instead of 300 and some thousand, there's going to be, uh, oh, I see. You're, you're saying you're going to have to put a whole bunch more money in. That's the point you're going to make. That's here, right. Rather than, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so you have to put three times. So that, that lost decade means that you have to put three times the amount in. Yep. And so this 35-year investment... Uh, at $900 per year is $31,500 as opposed to $13,500. Got it. So time and market is critical. Yes, absolutely. Even for a very small amounts of money. And of course, you know, we're, Paul's talk, spoken so much about investing for young children, right? Over that 75 year period or 70 year period, you know, you're talking multiple millions of dollars for these very small amounts of money. Well, I'll tell you, one of the million dollar decisions, you call them steps, Rich calls them ways, I call them decisions, but they're all the same thing. The other thing about that 20 year old, if they go to work, you go, you work at a firm where they match uh, a significant amount of what you put in. If you miss those first 10 years of matches, there's another another possible million dollar decision right there. But that's not on the list. So we're not gonna spend any more time on that. But I can move along here, I guess then. Yep. And this is the big one. This is the granddaddy. This is stocks versus bonds. And, uh, and, and why is that the granddaddy? So uh, as you know, and I'm gonna, it's incredible repeating a mentor's words uh, in front of the mentor. <laughs> um, but 
your stocks are your gas and your bonds are your break, right? Um, actually, Paul, I should just let you, let you say this again. Um, what's the difference between investing in stocks and bonds? Well, when you invest in stocks, you own part of that company. When you invest in bonds, you have loaned money to that company. So you might want to have Microsoft in your life by loaning Microsoft money, and they would pay you, oh, let's say 3% a year to borrow money from you. The U.S. government would borrow money from you. But you can't be a shareholder in the U.S. government, but you can in Microsoft. And so your other choice is instead of loaning money to Microsoft, own Microsoft so that you get the same return for your share that everybody else does. And that has been, I think, uh, for decades, something like a 26, 27% compound rate of return in that company. So the idea is, is that with stocks comes extra risk. And with stocks, as with all of these things we're going to compare, uh, you expect a higher, expect a higher rate of, of return. With individual stocks, sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. But with an, but with an index or, or a, a portfolio of hundreds or thousands of different companies, the odds of one company having a huge impact on the whole is very, very, very small. But here's the killer. Here's the reason this is such a huge decision. And that is, remember, and we didn't talk about it in the early part of this, uh, this presentation, so I'm just going to mention it. But for every half a percent, you can figure out, you can find somewhere in your portfolio, for every half a percent, it converts into about a million dollars over a lifetime, depending on how much, of course, you're investing. But if you've got a, an asset class that historically pays 10% stocks and another asset class that pays 5% bonds, you've got 10 half a percent pieces there, which suggests, and I know it's outlandish, that if you invest in stocks, you're going to probably make $10 million more than you would if you invested in bonds. What does it look like when you really put it to work? Does it look like that is possible is my question for you, Craig. Yep. So we're on the same screen and I'm gonna reset the, uh, the values. We're sticking with the S&P 500 and I'm gonna add a 0% stock allocation uh, to my 100% stock allocation. And so you can see I've now have two columns here. Uh, the, the one on the left, the leftmost column is a 0% stock. Uh, and the, the right column is 100% stock. I'm going to uh, return to this. I, I guess I'm going to set up our default scenario, which is 40 years. Uh, starting value is zero. We're going to invest in year one. We're going to have a 40-year contribution of $5,000 per year. Okay. And as I, referred, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that's kind of our default for, for this uh, for this presentation. So tracing down to the bottom, so I started in 1970 and historically uh, investing 500, I'm sorry, $5,000 per year uh, in all bonds, you come out with $1.4 million. If you were to invest in stocks, the bottom line is $2.6 million, right? And so after this 40 year period, uh, you've almost doubled your money by choosing the riskier, uh, the riskier investment of 100% stocks compared to bonds. And remember, uh, every three hundred thousand yeah. dollars is an extra million, right? So if so, there's multiple millions of dollars in this one decision alone. Yeah. And by the way, I, I think also you will show that this was, a, this was a particularly good time for bonds because we had inflation and bonds were paying, in fact, uh, in 1980, and that's in here somewhere. Yeah, there it is, year 11. In 1980, I bought a CD from the Bank of Chicago that paid 16% for five years. So that was not what we know today. I'm curious if instead of starting 
in 1970. Uh, what happens if you start in, uh, well, I guess it's 1980. Let's just see if that 10 years, what impact that has uh, on uh, that $1.4 million that you have there. Yep. So I, um, I just changed the first sequence year to 1980, kept everything else the same. And the bond portfolio, uh, the bottom number is $769,000. And the stock portfolio is $3.2 million at the end of 2019. Now, now we're talking about the $10 million difference, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, this is, and, 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 and so there, this is what that I think some people really love this calculator is because they can, they can look for these kinds of situations where you start in high inflation, end in low inflation, start in low inflation, end in high inflation. You can manipulate this uh, in many different ways, but, but you can also see what a difference a decade makes uh, to, uh, to the outcome of your, of, of your lifetime savings. All right. Have we made the point? Have we, have we made the case? Well, or is there more? There's just one more piece. Oh, okay. So, you know, we've just showed the extremes, right? And being a hundred percent in bonds or a hundred percent in stocks is not realistic for a lifetime. Right. Hmm. So um, I wanted to just show what a 50% a 50-50 allocation would produce, right? So I just changed the equity and fixed income. And so if I was for these 40 years in a 50-50 allocation, I'm going to go back to, actually, I'm going to stay at 1980 as the first sequence year. You can see uh, compared to a 0% stock allocation, which uh, the bottom number after 40 years in a $200,000 investment uh, re returns $769,000, a 50-50 allocation returns 1.6, right? And so the difference here is that there's less volatility, right? But the returns aren't as great. Uh, so if you compare 100% stocks versus a 50-50 allocation, you know, you've almost doubled your money there. You're at 3.2 at the end of this 40-year uh, period versus 1.6. But 1.6 is a heck of a lot better than 769,000. Well, I will just uh, uh, make one comment about what you just said. You said 100% stocks or 100% bonds is probably not. I think you used the word realistic. Uh, and here's what we know, that there are a lot of young investors who are refusing to have any money in stocks. They are all in bonds. And I've met lots of elderly people and at, at age 78, I now know what an elderly person looks like. But I also know that we don't all invest the same because there are a lot who are unwilling to take any risk at all. But I also want to be fair and say to those people who say, what about having all stocks all the time, all your life? It is a legitimate thing to do. It may not make sense to the person, well, like in my case, I had an investment in a company and I had it there for 30 years and it had done for me what I had hoped it would do for me and the people that we serve. And so I decided it's time to sell and I got out. But I know lots of, of, of people that have stayed the course and are still in and, do, and doing just fine. So an all stock or mostly stock portfolio is not as unusual as some people may think. It's just scary to a lot of people. Now we're talking about risk, having all your money in one company versus having it in many. And this, by the way, is one of the more difficult th things to judge. If we looked at it from the academic viewpoint, what the academics say is that the return of the stock market has been achieved because of about one out of 25 companies. And that literally half of the companies that have gone public never made any money in the end. They might've made some money for a while, but they didn't in the end. And it is the other half that has produced the profits. And that if you looked 
at the 96% of the companies, not in the top one out of 25, but you looked at the other 96%, the average return is the same return as risk-free T-bills. So the problem is with one company, you're not likely, or even a handful, you're not likely to do as well as you would in the market. But you, of course, have done some an actual study to show some examples of this. And I'd love to see them. Great. And so we'll start here talking about the Nifty 50. Uh, and so uh, I believe you were an, you were an advisor uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s. Well, well, actually, I was a stockbroker from 1966 to January of 1969. Before, I, that's when I went straight was in 1969. <laughs> But yes, I was around when the Nifty 50 was what was popular, uh, just like it. we had a similar thing in the late 90s, and we certainly have a similar thing right now. But, but go ahead. So my understanding, and I had to research this because Paul recommended it, uh, was that these were the 50 companies that you could buy and trust to survive no matter the cost. That's how they were sold. Is that right? Well, they were, in those days, a lot of people believed that the way to invest for the long term was to simply buy stock in a company and literally put it in a safety deposit box. In those days, when I first went into the business, people actually held certificates and put them away. And, 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 and so there were people who believed, and there still are people who believe, that you buy good companies and just let them be. And you just, they grow, as you grow old, they grow bigger. And these are the cream of the crop through the eyes of the people who were evaluating companies for the future at that time. And of course, as you know, they're not all household names anymore, or if they are, they're old household names, not, new, not the kind we look up to. That's right. And so when I look through this list, um, there were some that I uh, grew up with in my youth, uh, in particular Sears and Roebuck used to be huge. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, when I was trying to figure out the stock ticker for Sears and Roebuck, it was actually a conglomerate of, um, I guess, basically doesn't exist anymore because it was bought and it's now a conglomerate of, of a number of other companies. Yeah. Um, so that's happened to a number of, of these uh, companies. Of course, there are some that are still around today, you know, American Express, uh, 3M, McDonald's, Walmart. Uh, and so there were some that, you know, were really good investments. But the, the part of this lesson is that you can't necessarily pick the winners regardless of what the experts are saying. Yeah, and 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 so how how did you look at that in terms of evaluating that? I mean, I, I we know that is generally true, but do you want to show a couple of numbers or? Yep. So first of all, I have to say that the uh, Merriman Foundation Lifetime Investment Calculator doesn't deal with individual stocks, so I had to figure out you know how I could prove it, um, and I found that Portfolio Visualizer has a back test feature over here in the left hand side. So I've gone to portfoliovisualizer.com, you know, use the right tool for the job when needed. Um, and so you click back test portfolio, and this allows you to evaluate uh, stock individual stocks compared against a benchmark. So yes, I am showing somebody else's tool, but you know, I'm here to prove I'm here to prove a point. So we're going to set up the same our same common scenario, right? 40 year investment period, $5,000 per year. Uh, you can see that the start year, they don't have as much data uh, as, as we uh, have it in, in our, um, out, uh, our allocation back testing. So you know, S&P 500 goes back, uh, we currently have until 1970 published. Um, and they started in 1985 for individual stock data. So I found a couple of companies and I wanted to show the performance over the 40 year period from 1986 to 2015, uh, and we're going to set up our scenario, same scenario. So $5,000 starting value, we're going to contribute a fixed $5,000 uh, per year. That is not in, uh, inflation adjusted. We're going to compare that against the Vanguard 500 uh, index investor benchmark. And so this is, uh, as I understand it, one of Vanguard's first funds. 
Uh, and so we can, the chart displays, you know, each of these individual stocks compared to that baseline of the Vanguard 500. The first one we're going to choose is Coca-Cola with stock ticker symbol KO. We're going to choose Xerox and we're going to choose Unisys, um, which is UIS. Uh, Unisys is an interesting one because it was this Burroughs Corporation, according to Wikipedia. And then in 1986, they actually merged with Sperry. Um, so this, this was in the Nifty 50 and it, it uh, turned into a merge in 1986, which is why that's our start of year in this back, back test portfolio. And those were hot companies back then. Burroughs, oh, yeah. Sperry, I mean, they were, they were the high tech of, of, of that age. Yep. So I'm going to, I just uh, added the labels. Uh, now I have to add the actual asset. So I'm putting the stock ticker here. And I can display up to three different portfolios. So again, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to do 100% of each of these three stocks in, uh, in one portfolio each. Uh, of course, you know, Portfolio Visualizer is its own tool. I'm just giving a very simple example. Feel free to, to learn more about it uh, as you see fit. So I'm just going to double check my work here. $5,000 starting, 1986 to 2015, 5000 per year, and against the Vanguard 500 index. My name's good. All right, so I'll hit Analyze Portfolios. And in the summary view, I can scroll down. And uh, we have a graph here on the bottom. Uh, you know, I'd like starting with, photo, with pictures. I uh, wanted to note here that this is a logarithmic scale. Right? So it goes from 1,000 to 10,000, 100,000, et cetera. So these numbers are not as steep as they would be if it was on a, I guess, a, a dollar scale or a normal scale. So the orange line here is Xerox. No, I'm sorry, the orange line is Unisys. The red line is Xerox. The green line is the Vanguard benchmark. And the blue line is Coca Cola. So at the very end of this, you can see the journeys, right? Uh, Coca-Cola actually beat the, uh, the index over that 40 year period from 1986 to 2015, right? So if you bought 100% stocks in Coca-Cola, uh, you did incredibly well. Um, and I, mean, I would say you got lucky. Uh, I'll move up here to the table and you can see the final balances in the compound annual growth rate. So Coca-Cola in this instance, from starting in 1986 and then going up through uh, 2015, had a 19.98% cent, uh, uh, compound annual growth rate. And your $200,000 investment over those 40 years turned into uh, 1.1 million compared to the benchmark, which returned 778,000. Uh, I wanted to note though that Unisys, you put a $200,000 in uh, and your output was $38,000. And Xerox, unfortunately, uh, you lost about three three thousand uh, dollars over that forty year period. Well, and also if you look at the maximum drawdown, that's from peak to valley. Uh, Unisys lost ninety nine point two percent of its value at one point, if I understand that. That's right. And and that uh, Xerox lost ninety two percent, Coke fifty percent, and the S and P five hundred. Uh, about fifty percent. So, so it 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 is um, it, it's individual securities just are much much more risky. Uh, and what the academics believe is the expected rate of return of any single large cap growth company is the average of all large cap growth companies. That's what the academics believe. Of course, everybody who owns those individual companies shares believe they are worth a lot more than that. That's the nature of the optimistic investor. And so I wanted to note the role of luck here. Um, I'm gonna, you can see the final balance on Coke is $1.1 million. Uh, I'm going to change the starting year and change nothing else, but I'll, I'll change the starting year to 1990. So you start four years later, mm -hmm. and we end in 2020. Oh, and okay. I'll hit anal analyze again, and we'll scroll down to that table. And so instead of that nearly 20% compound annual growth rate, Coca-Cola returned a 17.5% compound annual growth rate during that period. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Vanguard, uh, I guess the S&P 500, returned an 18.5% uh, 
uh, uh, compound annual growth rate. And so in this scenario, you know, if you started five years later for whatever reason, um, you would have done better with the index compared to Coca-Cola. Yes. Thank you. I like that. That's a, that's a good example. All right. So ready, ready for me to move on or you got something more you want to Well, talk about? We, we haven't talked about how this leads to millions of dollars. Okay. What's your view? So my view is that, um, you know, com definitely compared to picking a loser, you're well ahead, right? So um, compared to picking Unisys, uh, we have, you know, multiple uh, 300, 300, 000, multiples of $300,000. So in this second example, where I started in 1990, uh, Unisys returned $100,000 for our investment. And the Vanguard index, if we were in the index, returned $900,000. So you're looking at $3 million or more um, because you chose the index over the uh, one of the companies that didn't do so well. And, and what, the, again, the academics will tell us is that you, when you own one company, you have the possibility of completely going broke, uh, and that 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 you 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 can protect against that only by having a whole bunch of companies, uh, and maybe it isn't one versus a thousand, but but in fact, and they will say the academics will say. It's about, it's one versus a hundred that at a, a hundred, you have plenty of protection, uh, but that you're not getting any premium. You're not, ex you don't have an expected extra amount of return because you own one company. And a quote that I actually made years ago was you should never make an investment that you don't have an expected re premium over the long term. Now, nobody ever uses my quote, but I remember it. Okay, on to what I tried to start before, which is one of my favorites, and that is paying high expenses or paying low expenses or paying no expenses. That's a possibility these days. What do you got for us there? How, how can you make the claim for the million dollar difference? Great. So, Paul, I actually wanted to ask you some of the expenses to look out for. So um, an expense isn't just the expense, the funds expense ratio, right? Yeah. There are many more other, many more things that you could be charged for. Yeah, get your checkbook out because here they come. Here, here, there's a load to buy a mutual fund if you buy a loaded fund, but it's only five percent, of course, and and it is for the professional help of an advisor who's acting theoretically in your best interest. And so instead of investing in suggesting that you invest in a index fund with no load, they recommend a load fund. And so there is a 5% right off the top. Guess what that translates into in the annual return of an equity fund? About a half of 1%. And then there are the expenses that you talk about in the mutual fund, but that does not include the turnover expenses in a mutual fund. Those are the costs of buying and selling. And the, and, and the cost of buying and selling an actively managed fund internally is not just commissions. It's also the spread between the bid and the ask every time that they want to buy or sell. And when you're talking about big, big mutual funds, when they want to get out of a position, they're likely having to put pressure on the market and force the price down rather than forcing the price up when they do when, when they're trying to buy. So, so there are a lot of real kind of subtle uh, hidden costs. And then and then there's taxes from the turnover. I mean, there's the cost of the turnover I mentioned, but the, that turnover is going to be an expense that leads typically to a tax cost. And believe it or not, when you look at the S&P 500, and, and Morningstar tracks this with individual mutual funds, it can be a one to one and a half percent tax a year tax advantage to the index investor uh, for somebody who's 
holding these in a taxable account. Well, boy, you start adding all those things up, and I don't know how much to deduct from the returns that a fund might make once you have all of those expenses. And I, maybe I've even overlooked an expense or two. I'm not sure, but that's the majority of them. And what do you do with that information then, Craig? Right. So that all turns into a percentage of your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you can cut your your uh, if you can cut your expenses, that's a guaranteed return uh, on top of what you were already getting. That's right. And so how do we convert that into a million dollars? Yep. So uh, I know you've been focusing on an extra half a percent over a 40-year period. And so what we're going to do in the calculator is we're going to change the historical returns by half of a percent to show you uh, how that uh, has an impact uh, on the uh, in investment over this 40-year period. Let me make sure I understand that. So if I look at the S&P 500 and I know that it returned uh, over the average 40-year period, it, it returned 11%. And so what we're going to do then is look at the return for the people who made less than that percent. Is that what we're – because – it's not a matter of adding to the index. It's a matter of deducting from the index to get an idea of how much more you're making. Is that in essence, isn't that the way it works? Yep. So, so instead of a positive number, we're going to put a negative half of a percent in there and we'll right. see what the outcome is. Yeah. So simulating the idea that they paid half of a percent in fees to, to be in that S&P 500. So I've, I'm at my our standard. Wait a minute. Wait yep. a minute. I got. I, I want. I want the. I want the truth here on the table. It is the average expense ratio in funds in the category of the S and P 500 is close to 90 basis points, almost one percent. So really, I'm saying if we're going to put this to the test. Let's look at, oh, you're thinking about the half of 1% as the magic half of All right, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, let's let's say it costs you uh, 40 basis points instead of 90 basis points to be in the S&P 500. Then you okay. say <laughs> in a particular fund, then you've, you've okay. saved your half of all a right, percent. All right, there you go. So I, I'm, I'm in our standard scenario. Again, 40-year duration, $5,000 per year uh, for 40 years of accumulation. The bottom number in the S&P 500 in 100% stocks is $2.6 million, all right? That's without this, this, uh, this, these expenses taken out. We have a field here called change historical return, and you can put any value between negative 100% and a positive 100% in there to, to simulate, um, uh, I guess, a, a different return. And it just takes that value off of whatever the return is that year. So I'm gonna put a negative 0.5%. And that $2.6 million turns into 2.289. So there's your $300,000 uh, right there over a 40 year period uh, by saving an extra half of a percent. And, and, the, and the reality is that um, the, the difference, and I guess we're gonna talk about index versus active, but that half a percent is the, that's the bottom. I mean, you, we got to do better than a half a percent for people to feel like we've, uh, they've paid the right price for that free PDF. Uh, so, so, uh, but here it is right there. There's that million dollars from that half a percent. That's great. Well, there you have it. Steps one through five. We're talking millions. Thank you for tuning in. We will continue with part two next week. I should note that you can download the free PDF of We're Talking Millions and access the Lifetime Investment Calculator right now on our website, paulmerryman.com. See you next week.